Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar about Manage Feature Store for Machine Learning. As you know, Feature Store has never been a harder topic than today, and all large AI companies build their machine learning platforms around Feature Store. So today, we want to help you understand what a Feature Store actually is, and how we can help manage feature data for enterprises and ease the path of data from back-end systems and data lakes to data scientists. Today, we also have our VP Engineering, Fabio Russo, to answer all your questions. So free free to send over any questions you might have in the live chat. It's located right in your, neck, in your right side of, of the screen. We do our best to answer all the questions. I will pass now along to our presenter today, Jim Dolan, CEO of Logical Clocks. Thanks, Antalya. Hi, welcome to the webinar. So this is gonna be a webinar that covers the feature store and in particular the Hopsworks feature store. It's the only fully open source feature store out there right now. It's the only enterprise feature store in the market currently. But we're gonna do some background, some motivation for the feature store, and we're gonna get technical later. Okay, so a little bit about us. We're Logical Clocks. Um, our headquarters are in Stockholm. And uh, we come from a kind of research background uh, with obviously a, a dash of Swedish uh, industrial experience with companies like MySQL and Spotify represented in our leadership team. Um, so the platform that I'm going to talk about today is Hopsworks. Hopsworks is an award-winning platform for data science, data science technology of the year in Europe 2019. Um, but it's built on, on many layers. So it's a full stack platform. We have a file system that won the IEEE scale prize in 2017. And then we've built the whole platform on top of it. The feature store, however, is a key component of the platform. It's available as a modular part. You can use it as a standalone product and you can use it with products like Databricks and SageMaker. And you can use it with on-premise on uh, Cloudera clusters or Mapora clusters or with Kubeflow. But we're going to talk about it within the context of the Hopsource platform today, uh, rather than integration with other ex external platforms. So the, today's journey is going to be about how you go from maybe where some of you are today, which is you're doing machine learning, you're trying to find out the best platforms that will help you be more productive in machine learning, and you've maybe stumbled across um, uh, the feature store concept, and you've read about companies like Uber who use feature store to improve the, the quality of the models they build and also the number of models they can build for the same amount of effort. And where they started and when, where many people start is by just having ad hoc scripts, maybe SQL or Spark, to take data from back-end systems and transform it into features to train models. And then you realize, well, hang on, we have lots of redundancy in our work. So let's share some of these feature pipelines from different systems and we'll, we'll reduce the amount of duplicated effort. And then you finally may say, well, let's have a managed platform to manage our features. That's where the feature store comes in. Today, we're gonna to go a little bit beyond that and say, well, if I have a feature store, what should my end-to-end -end machine learning pipelines look like? And we'll see, in fact, that it's not a fully end-to-end -end platform, but in fact, you have feature pipelines that end at the feature store, start at your backend systems and end at the feature store. And then you have another pipeline after the feature store where you train models and deploy them and validate them. And that's the model that we'll present uh, later in the webinar. Okay, so the feature store has become a very uh, hot topic. And I think one of the reasons is that the hyperscale AI companies all have feature stores. And then when the next tier of enterprises start working at machine learning, they'd like to learn from the pioneers in this space and jump ahead and have a feature store in their platform rather than have to spend a couple of years building from scratch. So the best known ones are maybe Uber's Michelangelo, Airbnb's Zipline. Um, there's another one called Go Gojek's platform called Feast, which is partly open source. And Facebook have FB Learner. But th these, these feature stores that are out there in production, they're currently being used to manage thousands of models at companies like Uber and tens of thousands of features that are used by data scientists to, to build models. So there's more information at FeatureStore.org. You can find a summary of some of the existing systems out there. But I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, I have an academic background, so we'll start at, at, at defining what an actual feature is. And I do this for the benefit mainly of data engineers who, who maybe look at, at data science and say, well, a feature is just a column on a table. What's, what's the big deal? Um, data scientists, of course, know that, that features are not 
just columns and tables. Sometimes they may be, but often you have to take that column and transform it. So it's going to be something that gives you some, some way to predict something that's of interest. So it's a measurable property of something you're, you're observing and you're trying to make a prediction with it. So a good example I saw recently was um, free rooms in a hotel. So if I have look at the number of free rooms in a hotel, my database maybe doesn't tell me, but I can write a SQL query to compute it. And that SQL query that computes it is an aggregate. And it's, uh, it's something that you can run over the existing uh, online production database. But it can be reused in many contexts. So it can be reused to predict uh, the amount of load in the, in the hotel. It can be used also to predict about marketing campaigns and to do special offers and things like that. So it can be reused in many different models. Uh, you have many other types of features, and not just aggregates, but you also have windows. So the number of times somebody has interacted with the website, maybe purchased something, put something in their shopping cart, transactions they've executed. And then we have very complicated features, things like embeddings, uh, graph embeddings, uh, language embeddings, uh, word embeddings, sen sentence embeddings, um, that represent very, very complex high dimensional data that also has predictive qualities. So the feature is, is, is the key thing that we're talking about here. We're trying to take these features and, and generate them from back-end databases. And what the feature store does is provide this API between the back-end systems where our data is stored in databases and data lakes. And our data will typically be strings as varchars, or maybe we have numerical data as ints. And when we want to get it into uh, a model to train a model, we need numerical data. And typically, you want to have something like 32 floating point 32-bit numbers and you'll have arrays of those. And how do you get from the backend system into that numerical format? And that's where feature transformations and feature engineering comes into it and where the feature store really helps. So let's first define what feature engineering is a little bit more uh, concretely. So if we imagine that we have some features that we think are ready, and as a data engineer, you might say, hey, this is an array of uh, numbers. And I can see that they're floating point numbers, which is nice. That goes straight into a model. And a data scientist might say, no, 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 hang on. Look at some of these numbers. We've got 10, which is quite high, and we've got lower numbers three. We won't have very good numerical stability. I'm going to normalize this array of numbers. So we'll normalize the values between either 0 and 1 or minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. So that operation of normalizing the data means you need to typically write code to do it. If you're going to do data pipelines that are uh, of high quality, tested, and, and versioned. So you might write that code, for example, in PySpark, and it might look like something like the following. We can see that we have a data frame down here. That's the data that we're reading in here, this data frame. And then we apply this normalization transform to it. And then what we'll get out is, and then we might drop this column, the features column, we're left with the normalized column in our data frame. So that's the feature engineering and, and a, a concrete example of it. So. That example I showed you was, was feature engineering in Python. And you can imagine that you have a training pipeline that takes this input data. And that's this one down here. So I'm going to just ring it down here. We're talking about training. And we've written some code in Python to, to convert these input features um, because we're going to normalize them. Um, and then we apply some labels that we have to train our models. So training is basically about taking your input data. It's supervised machine learning, so we assume there are labels for that input data. And with training, we'll get a model that will help us make predictions. In inferencing, when you're using the model, you take your input data again, you apply the model, and you get predictions. And that's the output labels. So we can see there's some symmetry here between training and inference. But the problem that we see here is that the code to compute these transformations, this feature engineering, it might be written in Python down here, and it might be written in Java up here. And now we have a problem of maintaining two code bases and ensuring the consistency of the data across two different languages, which is a very hard problem to solve. So the feature store helps us solve this problem for many different features by basically providing a, so this is the problem that's difficult to ensure consistent features between training and inference. But the feature store provides us with a single place where we can do our feature engineering. We're going to do our feature engineering once. We're going to materialize the features or cache them in the feature store. And then when we want to train with the features, <coughs> excuse me, notice I coughed into my elbow, which is good practice. Um, so 
we're going to use those features for training, but we're going to get them from the feature store. So they'll already be fe uh, feature engineered. And when we're doing inferencing, we're also going to get the features from the, from the feature store. Many of the features are, are uh, relate to historical data. So in fact, a lot of the features we can get directly from the feature store. So the feature store will help us reuse these feature uh, engineering pipelines between training and inference. So let's talk about our particular feature store. So if you've read about Michelangelo or Zipline, you'll see that they have a domain specific language for doing these transformations. So transforming the, the backend data into features. We found that that was not a very general purpose way of um, generating features. It's they have specific solutions for their platforms and their use cases. So we want a general purpose platform. So our general purpose platform is based around the abstraction of the, of the data frame. And the data frame you may be familiar with from Pandas or from PySpark or from ScalaSpark or JavaSpark. So what we introduce is the notion of a group of features together, which you can think of as being a data frame. So you have a number of columns and here we have the columns and this is our data frame here but we call them feature groups so a feature group is a, a group of features that are computed together and they're ingested uh, at the same cadence so this is a well-known example from data science we have something called the titanic passenger list and in the titanic problem you have a number of features such as the class of the passenger traveled in their sex and you want to predict whether they survived or not so we can imagine that this feature group, the Titanic passenger list is in our feature store. And the historian comes along and researches the passengers and discovers the amount of money they had in their bank accounts. And they ingest that into the feature store as well. So now we have two feature groups, the Titanic passenger list and the passenger bank account data. A data scientist can come along at this point and say, hang on, I have a hypothesis. If I join together the passenger bank account feature with the passenger list features, I can make better predictions about whether a, per, a, a passenger on the Titanic will survive or not. Maybe the hypothesis is that if they had a lot of money, they would bribe to get on a lifeboat. Okay, so the data scientist, we can see does this, it looks very complicated if you look on the screen, we can see lots of arrows going in there, but really all the data scientists will see is they'll see this training data set. So we call it training test data set. So it's the data set that the data scientists will work with. And these are the features that they want to have. So this notion of joining is here because we want to reuse features. So if we just have features that are pre-computed from our feature engineering pipeline, we, we go directly to a training data set. But in this case, the feature store, we want to reuse the features. So we, we have to join them together from existing feature groups. And then they can be reused in many different training and test data sets. So the data scientists will, will pick the features they want to use put them together into a trained data set, and then pick a file format that they want to train their models with. So you can take this training test data set and materialize it, save it to disk. It can be TF records for TensorFlow, .npy files for NumPy, uh, in particular for PyTorch, and then CSV files maybe for scikit-learn or Petastorm if you have large volumes of data. Petastorm is a very interesting scalable file format from Uber that has native readers in both TensorFlow and PyTorch. The file can now be stored in the file system that you want to, to, to work with. So if you're working with SageMaker or if you're working with uh, Databricks on AWS, you might decide to use S3. Um, but in today's case, we're going we're to store the data directly on Hopsworks. So we're going to work with the HopsFS file system, which is a next generation HDFS file system. OK, so What's interesting about this then is that the features, the feature groups and the train test data sets, there are key abstractions now. We can now version them. So we can have new versions of features or new versions of feature groups when we make breaking schema changes to our feature groups. If we have compatible uh, changes or updates to, to our, our data frames or feature groups, we don't necessarily need to in, uh, increase the semantic version number. We can keep the version number. But when we have breaking changes, like dropping of, of, of features, but then we'll need to increase the, the feature uh, group version. Training data sets are typically immutable and versioned. Um, you, it is possible and sometimes there are cases where you need to make them mutable, but typically it's, it's preferable to make them immutable. Okay, so we, we've introduced the abstractions. We've got training data sets, feature groups, and features. So um, let's talk a little bit about how we get these feature groups, these groups of features into our feature store. 
So features will look differently depending on, on how often they're being updated in the feature store. You may have, for example, low latency features, real-time data that's coming in. You may have event data that comes in less frequently, and you may have data coming from SQL, SQL data warehouses, and even from data lakes. Now, this, these different data sources will have different time requirements. So maybe, for example, your real-time data needs to be, it's coming in from the web page, the user is, is, is filling in some insurance form or some loan application, and you need to transform that data. You need to do it within a couple of seconds. Uh, maybe you have data coming in from, from, from user clicks from a streaming application that's updated every few seconds. Um, maybe you have data, change data, capture data from your databases, your transaction databases, production databases. And then you may have less frequent data that comes in from um, larger data lakes. So depending on, on, on how these different uh, features arrive in, um, and that raw data arrives in, and we want to do the feature transformation, you may want to use a different type of framework. But ultimately, we want all this data to end up in the feature store. Now, there is one, one case, which is that the real-time, you know, very low latency feature transformations that need to be done in the app or by some pipeline that's that's in sub-second. But anything else, you know, above five seconds or more, you can often handle in the feature store. You can push it to the feature store. And if the online application needs those features uh, to build feature vectors for inferencing, well, then they should be able to pull them with very low latency. Otherwise, when you want to use the feature store to generate training data, or if you want to use it to, to run batch applications to do inferencing on the data stored in the feature store, uh, then you don't have the same latency requirements. You maybe need to have the large volumes of data, but you don't necessarily need to get the features back within a, a, a low latency budget. So what's interesting here is that we want the feature store to handle both of these use cases. We want online applications to get low latency access to features. And we want then also to have a scalable store to handle large volumes of data for training and batch inference. The problem is that there's no existing database that we know about that scales to very large data volumes and has, has very low reliable latencies. So what we do internally in our feature store is we introduce the notion of what we call an online or serving feature store, where the online applications can get their features with low latency, and also an offline feature store. And this is a, a scalable SQL database that will store our features, and uh, then they can be used to generate training data, and even um, batch applications can use them for inferencing. Now, this last line that appears here, this is also showing you that when you, you are computing features, you would like, potentially, those features to be stored in both the online and offline. Sometimes you want to store them in only the online, sometimes only the offline, but sometimes you want them in both. So we want this uh, feature store abstraction be able to handle that. So the feature computation pipeline should be able to just push the data to both the online and offline if needs be. So this is an abstract diagram. If we get concrete into the Hopsworks feature store, we support different frameworks for computing features, for doing feature transformations. So some of them you may be familiar with, such as Pandas and Python, and then we have Spark. You can also do streaming. Uh, so Spark streaming or Flink is also supported in the platform. Now, for very low latency applications, Flink, which is not a batch streaming uh, framework, works very well. Uh, for slightly higher latency streaming applications, Spark Streaming works well. If you don't have large amounts of data, Python Pandas works well, and Spark works very well with larger amounts of data. The key point that unifies um, these different feature pipelines is that we have this data frame API. So the data frame, frame API here simplifies the ingestion of data to our online and offline feature stores because it provides a general purpose API. So with this general purpose API, you can write your code once, your feature engineering code once, and then you just push it and you say, well, I'd like it to go to both the online and offline feature store. But the abstractions that users deal with are feature groups. We're trying to abstract away the complexity of dealing with the, the dual databases, the online one and the offline one. OK, so let's have a look at some code, make it a bit more concrete. We said there's a data frame API. So if you're familiar with Pandas or, or with Spark, you'll know that you can ingest a data frame from a file, for example, or a set of files, a directory. Uh, you do your feature engineering, and I showed an example of that code uh, earlier on. 
And then all you need to do to get that data frame uh, into the feature store is create a feature group and give the feature group a name. So we're giving it the name Titanic data frame. There are other options such as online equals true, offline equals true, and you, by default online is, uh, is false actually and offline is true. But you just change the switch and the data feature group gets persisted to both online and offline stores um, if both of them are set to true. So we can see in a bit more detail for those of you who, who, who understand the internals of Spark um, and, and our backend systems, we're using MySQL cluster or NDB as our online feature store, and we're using Hive as our offline feature store. So they're both open source database systems, and they're both tightly integrated into our file system because all three layers, the, our file system, the Hive and MySQL cluster share, share the same unified metadata layer. So what happens when we use Spark, and this, can, this Spark application can run on an external Spark cluster if you want. Today, we're going to just run it up from Hopsworks. This code will get executed in your, in your notebook or in your, your uh, Scala program or in your Python program, PySpark program. And that program will have an API key to be able to talk to the REST API to the Hopsworks platform. And that's going to create the feature metadata. And we're going to compute statistics over that feature group. And we're going to add them to our feature store. Um, but we're also going to have to store the actual data. So we're going to we're going to cache these computed features in the feature store. So currently, we support Parquet and Orc as um, file formats with which we can persist this uh, data frame. Um, you'll need a certificate. Um, so your Spark program will have this certificate that it will use to securely persist that um, data frame to the uh, to our file system. And then we'll create an external table or a managed table in Hive, depending what type of feature group you create, um, to, to manage that, that, that feature group. If you also decide to use the online feature store, we, we currently support JDBC as a way to um, persist that feature group or data frame to the uh, MySQL cluster. And it does it with uh, TLS support. And what we get all together then is we have, this is our ingestion pipeline that, that we just talked about. Um, we have the ingestion pipeline for bringing the data in. And then after that, we have these online applications, batch applications, model training. Um, that's how we're going to use this feature store. So let's have a look at using the feature store. So this is more the data scientist um, perspective on the feature store. Typically, data scientists will help identify features and maybe even help debugging the computing of features to make sure the logic is correct. But often, they don't maybe necessarily write all of those data pipelines because it involves skills primarily uh, possessed by data engineers. So the data scientists will go to the feature store. They'll look at the available features. And typically, they might want to just do what we did earlier in the example. We'd like to join together a bunch of features. We're going to join these features together, and we're going to get back a data frame. So when you run this code in Hopsworks, it will automatically have the, the, the API keys and the certificates that it needs. And we, we, we make them available transparently to you. Um, but if you're writing a, a, a simple pandas program, for example, and, and you, you say this should be a pandas data frame that you get back, you can go ahead and use scikit-learn and train your model. If, however, it's a larger volume of data and you're going to write a, a program in TensorFlow, you might run this as a standalone program because you're going to save this data frame as TF record files. And you're going to save it, in our case, in our file system. You can also, of course, save it to S3 to a bucket where you can train in, in SageMaker or, or Databricks, if that's your cup of tea. OK, so data scientists can use the, the, the feature store um, by basically selecting a flat namespace of features. What will happen behind the scenes is that we have a query planner that will try to find a common join key. In this case, the join key will be name. And the, the algorithm it follows is to find the largest overlapping set of features between all the feature groups from which these uh, individual features uh, originate. You can, of course, override that join key by hand, and sometimes you need to do that. And in the upcoming version of our feature store, we do add scope to this so that you can also scope your feature names by feature group to ensure there's no clashes in the namespace. OK. let's. Let's move on. So this is, we're still going at a, quite a brisk pace. So let's look at what happens internally when, when the data scientist runs that code. What's going to happen is, is that the, uh, this piece of code that we just looked at will get executed. Again, it can run on an external Spark cluster if you so choose. 
Um, but what will happen is, is that it will um, join the features together by basically reading up the different features as data frames and then running a Spark program to join those data frames together on the given join key. And obviously, you have to do optimizations, as many optimizations as you can, to ensure that join is performed uh, efficiently. And then uh, the Spark cluster can save that data frame to a file format uh, on a given storage platform um, that you, you supply in, in, that we saw on the line after it. Now, I'm going to just move, move on to another topic. Um, this, I think, is probably, apart from the online feature stores, is the last uh, kind of abstraction that we're going to introduce for the feature store. Uh, one problem that you have with, um, with, with machine learning in general is that if, for example, you have made a prediction, uh, for example, that a transaction is fraudulent, and six months later you find out, hang on, um, the, the transaction was actually fraudulent. Or maybe you made a prediction that the transaction was not fraudulent, and six months later you find out it was fraudulent. In both of those cases, we have new information, a new sample that we would love to include in our training data because we know that this that the features that that, that we supplied at the time they predicted something and then we know the outcome so if we join the outcome with the prediction we made we have great new training data it's worth gold or weight in gold the problem you may have is that you may have used a feature like well how many items did i have in my shopping cart at the time how many transactions did i run in the day before that or the, the hour before that Typically, in a data warehouse, those values will get updated the whole time, and you can't go back in time and say, well, what did the feature look like at this moment in time? So if you use uh, time travel, uh, you can do this. right? So if, you're, if your feature group is backed by Hoodie, in our case, which is a, a framework that supports time travel, so every time you update a feature group, you get a commit ID for that update. And if you store all of the updates, well, then you can do time travel and, and go back to particular points in time to get values of features, or you can also look at intervals. You can say, for example, hey, I would like to get the features between 2017 and 2018 or 2019, and then maybe I'll save 2020 as my test data. Um, this is really good for, for, for both reproducing, and reproducing um, these predictions so that we can uh, generate new training data, also for being able to reproduce models, because if you train a model on a given version of a training data set and you need to recreate the training data set, if you know the, the commit ID of the feature groups that you join together, well, now you can recreate that training data set perfectly. OK, so time travel uh, is supported by Hoodie on our platform. Hoodie has support for indexing or, so that when you need to make time travel queries, it uses something called a Bloom fin filter to make those queries efficient. Um, and again, you can you know, save all of this uh, uh, data frame that you get back in the file format of your choosing on a storage platform of your choosing. Okay, so the last abstraction I want to introduce is the online feature store. And the online feature store, as we saw already, is this serving database. It's a way in which an online application can get very low latency access to features. And the motivation for it is, is that if I take my fraud example from earlier, um, in, in fraud, maybe my application that's running, uh, I get a transaction arrives. I know the ID of the customer who, who is sending money to someone else, and I know the ID of the customer who's receiving the money, and maybe the bank's involved. Um, there's not very much more information than that available in the online application. I don't know how many transactions this user has executed in the last day, last week, last month. I don't know any um, uh, customer history information, any credit scores for that customer. Uh, but that data can come from your online feature store. So you can compute those features, historical features, and even nearly real-time features, and make them available in the online feature store so that your online application can still use those features when it's making predictions. So the online application will have those few features that, that it has internally. And it can, with those features, which are typically going to be entity IDs, IDs for customers, maybe timestamps, maybe bank IDs, things like that, uh, session IDs, it can use those IDs to make a query to the online feature store. In our case, it's an in-memory database, so it'll be very low latency. And it will build up this feature vector. Um, we can see that, that in this case, our database is running on, a, on an instance in a, a particular zone in the cloud. You can have your model also hosted on the same uh, zone in the cloud. 
uh, in a given region. And once you have that feature vector, you can send that feature vector to a model being hosted on a, a container in the cloud for a prediction. You can also, of course, host the model, uh, have the model embedded internally in your application. But often, if the update lifecycle of the model and uh, the application are different, well, then you, you might want to make sure that the model is hosted externally so you can update it more frequently uh, than the application. So what we can see here that is that if we look at, at our particular online feature store, MySQL cluster, it can run highly available across availability zones in the cloud. Um, and you can do it, of course, on-prem, highly available. So if you look at some other systems out there, people are using Redis, which doesn't have this high availability or um, ACID properties. Um, so if you're building production systems or operational AI applications that need low latency, guaranteed low latency access and highly available database, then we think that this MySQL cluster solution is a, is a very uh, good one for this particular use case. So if you want to know how it works internally, um, we have our online application, which has a, a few keys, these entity IDs I mentioned, things like user IDs, session IDs, timestamps. And with those keys, we can, um, we can firstly, we can go to the, to the feature store and say, well, what's the JDBC query I need to build up the feature vector for this model that I'm using? And then it'll return the uh, template of that query. And with the keys, we can plug them in there to that query. Um, and then we can send that query down to the, the feature store, the online feature store, to get our feature vector back. And once we have the feature vector, we can make predictions on our model. And that's using JDBC in particular for, for latency reasons and security. It's a trusted, um, uh, very well tested uh, API uh, and protocol. OK, so that's the, the feature store um, covered. Now, the feature store works within the context of the Hopsworks platform. And the Hopsworks platform is a full uh, data science platform with a feature store and with large-scale data parallel processing. So it doesn't just include our feature store in the file system, metadata storage. Uh, we also have the Spark uh, computing engine for batch and for streaming and Flink as well. Um, and we also have Kafka comes with the platform. So um, you can also, in some cases, do real-time feature transformations uh, using Kafka. Uh, and Flink, as I gave an example earlier. And in addition to this, you can also train your models in the platform. So we do support distributed deep learning, distributed machine learning. Um, we'll introduce the abstraction of a project and how you can install your Python libraries in that project and run your uh, develop your, your notebooks in Jupyter and even run those Jupyter notebooks as part of pipelines if you want to. Um, the pipelines will be defined in Airflow in this example because we support Airflow in the, frame, in the, in the platform. If you have your own Airflow, you can use uh, that to, to, to orchestrate jobs being run on our platform as well. Our platform also supports model serving on an external Kubernetes um, framework or, or uh, cluster. Um, if you want, you can try it. We do have an open source version that you can install with the platform for, for testing, but typically you'll plug it into uh, a production Kubernetes cluster to serve models. And finally, to close the loop of, of, of the whole end-to-end -end machine learning um, pipeline, we do monitoring of models by taking the predictions that are made uh, on the models and storing them in our Kafka uh, cluster. So from Kafka, then we can, we can stream those predictions to a Spark streaming application that can then use statistics computed in the feature store to see if the features coming in, if there's drift in those compared to the ones we used when training the models. So this closes the whole loop. And um, being able to use streaming applications like Spark that have very good support for windowing semantics, where you want to compute windows or distributions of feature values over time, um, that gives you a very nice way of ensuring that you're not going to generate too many bogus alerts um, when you do have uh, drift in, in the input data. OK, so how this kind of plugs in together, we have our, our feature store here. And we have this feature engineering we talked about that takes the back end data. From the feature store, you're going to do experiments. And typically, we saw already that the data scientists might select features to create training and test data. They'll train their models. And typically, you'll have another stage of, of validating those models, so scoring the models ensuring that they're good enough to be pushed into a model repository. And once those models are in a model repository, you can use them directly in batch applications for inferencing, or you can deploy them to model serving servers 
uh, for example, in Kubernetes, from where online applications can actually then use them. And typically, we said already, you would want to use the feature store to help you build these larger feature vectors. And finally, you want to monitor those models in production. And we, we said that Kafka and Spark Streaming uh, is a good way to do that. So this is the, the, the kind of, to put that, it, this end-to-end um, -end vision in the context of people, well, we have a data engineer who will generate features and responsibilities. So if you're organizing your teams and you have a big enough team, maybe you'll give these roles to the different uh, groups or teams. But in a smaller organization, individuals will play more than one role. So we see it the way we see this ML lifecycle is that the data engineer's job is to generate features in the feature store. And those features can be handed off to a data scientist who can build the models. And the models get ultimately deployed in a model repository uh, after they've been designed and you have experimentation and you've found good hyperparameters and validated them. Um, and that whole uh, iterative process has been uh, gone through. So once the models have deployed in the repository, you can use them directly in batch applications. But if you want to put them in production in online applications, you might need an ML engineer to make sure that those models are well encapsulated behind the model API, so an inference API. And the reason why you want to have an API is you might want to load balance uh, those requests over many models for HA and for high throughput. Um, you might also want to log the predictions as we're doing to Kafka so that you can generate dashboards with alerts and KPIs of your models and also that you can log the predictions because later on you might get outcomes uh, that you for the predictions you made that you will help you generate new training data. And finally, when you have uh, model APIs, your applications can then just plug into them to make predictions, but they may, may also need to use the online feature store to help them build their uh, feature vectors. So that's the end-to-end -end life cycle. And, and I think this has kind of covered everything we're going to talk about in terms of the background. And I'm going to kind of move on to a demo now, so that show you how you can get started on Hopsworks. And this is the agenda for the demo. Um, we'll see how much of this we get covered. And um, if you're curious about the platform itself, it is an open source platform, and the open source version is fully featured. You can do um, pretty much everything we talked about here. There are some parts that are in the enterprise-only version, so Kubernetes support, uh, integration with LDAP, um, Active Directory, OAuth 2, GitHub support, and some um, features in online model serving as well. So uh, if you want to try out Hopsworks, you can go to hopsworks.ai. It's a managed version of Hopsworks on AWS currently, and it will manage clusters for you. So I'm going to show that in a second. And I don't know if I have any questions at this point. We have um, maybe Natalia can summarize some of them. I think Fabio is handling them. Um, OK, so uh, you can shout out Fabio if you have questions. But I'm going to move on and look at Hopsworks AI. No questions. I'll take that as no questions. I'll just move on. OK. Um, many questions, so, this, so you can move on to demo. OK, let's move on to the demo. We can take questions at the end. So this is Hopsworks.ai. It's, it's a managed version of uh, the Hopsworks platform. It's the only managed feature store available today. Um, you can you can log in here. I've logged in already, uh, create an account. If you don't have an AWS account, it will give you access to a demo instance. So you can just you know, kick the tires of the platform, run some jobs, try it out. If you do have an AWS account, um, you can configure uh, Hopsworks AI to allow it to launch virtual machines in your AWS account. So what that means, basically, if you, if you, I think you click on settings here, we have a nice new UI, which I, don't, I can't navigate around as well as before. Um, but what we need to do is you need to configure this cross-account role. And there's a tutorial for how to do it. And I think you can kind of see some of it here. We need to create a cross-account role, add an inline policy, store the cross-account role, and then you're kind of done. So you'll need to follow those two, three steps. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. If you have only an access key, you can do that as well. So if you have an AWS private key or secret key and an access key, uh, you can you can use those to, to, to allow Hopsworks AI to launch Hopsworks cluster in your um, account. So once you set that up, uh, then what you can do is you can create a cluster. So we can see this create cluster. And you can create, an, I think, pretty much any most regions in the world are covered here. 
at least um, I think all the continents, maybe not South America, but um, the other continents are covered. And you can pick, uh, you know, diff we, you can support very large instances or um, smaller ones. Uh, currently, we're limiting it to just one node, but that will be changed soon. Um, if you have S3 buckets that you want to use, you can add them in there. And you can basically click through this. You can add your own SSH key. If you're going to access, um, for example, different S3 buckets or different uh, uh, resources in, in AWS, you might want to add um, uh, an instance profile that gives you permissions to do that. And um, you've got to launch it into a different VPC. So uh, you can create a new one. If you want to use Databricks, you might need to pick their VPC to launch it in. If you want to get started easily, you're not good. You can also use something called VPC peering to connect with Databricks, which is more an enterprise feature. If you aren't using VPC peering, then you might select Databricks uh, subnet. But in general, you might just create a new one and go into that new subnet. And same with security groups, you can kind of configure this. If, if you feel that, that Hopsworks AI is taking too many permissions, we do have a, a, a in, our, in our documentation, uh, we show you a way to skip over some of these steps so that you don't have to give these permissions to the platform. And um, you can do some of those steps manually instead. So then you can create your cluster. Now, I, I've created clusters already, so I'm just going to go back to the clusters that I created. It takes roughly five minutes, I think, to, to, to spin up that cluster once you create it. This one is already running. Um, it was this one here. And I just clicked on it, and that brings us to Hopsworks. And I think I have another one here in the States. So this one is in Europe, if I believe. Yeah, EU West one. You can also make backups of the cluster, um, have a look in, at what cert. You can also, yeah, this is important if you're going to use it with Databricks, you can expose or, or make those services, the online feature store, open up the port so that other external applications can actually access the online feature store or Kafka or um, if it's a Databricks application that wants to, to, to create feature groups or, or update feature groups, you'll need to expo expose the uh, feature store service as well. So exposed doesn't mean open to the internet because everything is, of course, uh, authenticated with uh, uh, either API tokens uh, over uh, network encrypted channels or with uh, certificates, so with two-way certificates. In this case, it just means basically that the port is opened um, between our particular Hopsworks instance and, and, for example, a Databricks cluster or a SageMaker cluster. So that network traffic can flow between them. But of course, the traffic will be encrypted. Uh, OK, so let's look at the platform. This is Hopsworks that you'll get. And we, we, we get we're using the username and password to log into it. In enterprise versions, you, you kind of have single sign-on with Active Directory. Now, I already ran this thing called the Feature Store Tour. Um, there's another one for deep learning called the Deep Learning Tour. And um, what we end up in the platform is we have this thing over here called Projects. So the project you can think of as being something like a GitHub repo. So I assume. Everybody knows what GitHub is and a GitHub repository is. A GitHub repo typically will have users in it. You'll have um, code. In our case, we'll also have data. So we're going to have users, code, and data. And what's interesting about our approach is we call it project-based multi-tenancy, that the code and the data inside a project is private to the people inside the project. And it's actually like a full sandbox. So what that means is that if I am running some code inside this, and we can imagine this is our production feature store, well, I'm, and I also am a member of a different project, the development feature store, I can't read from here to here. I can't, in my programs running in one project, read data from the other project, even though I am a member of both. Because what we're doing is we're creating a, a unique identity for each user inside every project. So the project in our production feature store, the users in there are called the production feature store users. So my name is Jim, and Jim, who's in the production feature store, can't read data from Jim in the development feature store because it's a different user. So we're using certificates to, to identify those users and two-way um, uh, certificates to typically authenticate users and programs applications internally in the platform. OK, so let's look at the feature store. So these things called projects. And um, you can have, of course, a development feature store, a production feature store, even individual users or sensitive feature stores, feature stores that you don't want to make available to the rest of your enterprise or organization. Now, when you log into the platform, 
what we can see here on the left is that there's a number of, you can think of them as microservices, and one of them is the feature store, not that one. Let's go back. Uh, this is our feature store one here. So let's have a look at a few of them. I'm going to start by just showing the basic things. We have members in the project. You can add members, and they can have roles, data scientist or data owner. The data owner can upload new data. Data scientists can really just do analytics inside here, just run jobs, write, write, job, write output logs and files but maybe not update existing data sets. Um, we have a file browser, this data sets here. So you can go in and look at, at training data sets if you have any, or any notebooks and things like that that can be stored in here. Um, notebooks can also come from GitHub, depending if you're using Enterprise or not. Um, you have some settings for the project. Um, you, you know, we can see here that there's a couple of services that are not enabled in here, it's Kafka and Serving, um, but most of the other ones are. So let's have a look directly at the feature store. So this is the feature store for this project, the tour project. And what we can see is that the abstractions that we introduced, the features, the training data sets, and then the feature groups are available as tabs in here. And then we have something called the feature store details. So I'm gonna just look at the details just to see what's in this feature store. This is an overview of the feature store. We can see that there's seven feature groups and 27 features in total and only one training data set. And if you have a development feature store, a production feature store, you may have them all available here. Um, we can do an example of, uh, I'll just show you how we can make this production feature store available in another um, feature store by basically sharing it. We can share it with this other project that I have here. So um, just to briefly show you what that means, if I go to this other project, this we can assume this is our development feature store. And if I go in here, we can see that this feature store is different. It only has two feature groups and seven features. But what I did was I shared it with this project. So I'm going to accept the shared feature store and say, OK, I'd like to have access. In this case, I'm only getting read access to it. But that means I can join features from the different feature stores. So from the production one and development, I can join them to test them out to see if my new features are good enough to maybe move them into production later. So from here, you can see that we can change between our feature stores. <laughs> now we're at the one with 27 features, and we can go back to the development one with seven features. So let's go back to the one that we looked at earlier. I'm just going to click back to it. And we looked at the details of features. We have connectors, so I can create a connector to S3, a bucket if I want. We have connectors to our file system and even to external JDBC uh, data warehouses if we want to use those. But let's look at the feature groups now. So the feature groups are these um, groups of features computed together. And if we look at the view feature group details option here, we can say a brief overview of this feature group. It has a name, a description. It has a schema. It has three features in it, and they are numerical features. You can get a preview of the data in here. <laughs> so it's this exploratory data analysis. You can see the job that was used to compute this feature. We could click on that to go to the job. And we can also um, look at some of the statistics that were computed when we ingested this feature group. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the correlation matrix computed. And, and these scale to like tens or hundreds of features. When you get to thousands, it can become problematic. And you can turn off the computation of some of the in different uh, <coughs> statistics being computed. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that's hay fever. <coughs> I hope it's hay fever. OK, so we also have clustering analysis, and we have descriptive statistics, You know, um, the mean, max, min, uh, standard deviation, and number of rows for the, each of the individual features. So this is a pretty useful way of doing exploratory data analysis for data scientists and distribution of individual feature values. Um, so. <clears throat> One point I'd like to point out at this point is that we can also do something called data validation for a given feature group. And this is a really nice feature. So what data validation basically means is I can ingest a feature group, and in my Python program or my PySpark program to ingest it, I can do my feature transformations. But maybe I don't have any good library in Python with which to do real data validation. So there's a library called TFX data validation. And there's another one called uh, DQ by Amazon, but it's not available in Python. It's only in, in Scala and, and Java. Uh, we make that DQ library available through this UI. You can basically take any feature group, and then you can, you can write these 
effectively what they are are predicates on your feature group. So we can have a warning or an error if the size of this feature group, the number of rows in it, is not within this interval. We can look at the completeness for any given individual feature and say, well, it has to be fully complete, 1.0, 1.0. And if it isn't, I'm going to generate an error. <coughs> so we can go on. And there's a DQ has, has many of these predicates that you can define over your feature group to basically ensure the quality of the data that's coming in. And what you get at the end is you'll get basically a set of uh, rules or recipe, this is a recipe, a set of rules that will be applied to validate the data in your feature group. And that's going to be ultimately just a Spark program. And that was this Spark program that was generated. And we can run that Spark program. So we can go off and say, oh, please run that Spark program. And that will then validate uh, that feature group. Now, you might say, well, that's kind of useful, but I'd like to do it in a pipeline. Well, of course, you can do it in a pipeline. We, we support Airflow internally. So we have a nice user interface to help you define Airflow pipelines. It, data engineers can write this by hand, but data scientists sometimes have issues. So they might say, well, I don't know how to write an Airflow pipeline. How do I do it? So we're going to do write one just called data validation train. And uh, we don't need an API key here. We're just going to click next. So what we're going to do is we're going to select these jobs. We saw those jobs that just a, a second ago. And I'm going to put two jobs together into a pipeline. The first one will validate these features. And I'm going to wait for it to finish. And then I'm going to add another job, which is the train job. And it's going to wait for the data validation to finish. You might not, not say, well, I'm not going to validate before I train. I'm just going to ingest the, the data then do the validation, and that's my pipeline finished. And, and that's completely a uh, valid approach. So maybe you have a, a feature engineering job, and then a data validation job, and then you're done. But the basic point is you can get a pipeline, uh, an Airflow pipeline, very easily in the platform. Um, and that was this one that I just created. And the data scientist can go ahead and edit this and, and, and add a Slack notification and understand it. It's a very small program. It's using a HopSource uh, job operator. You can run this from an external. Airflow cluster as well. And <clears throat> then you can go and open Airflow, and it'll pop up your um, pipeline in there. So if we go back to our feature store, um, what we can see is, and we, we were running a job there. I think we just ran that one just to show you it kind of ran and accepted, and it's completed. Um, the feature store here, we said that we have these feature groups, and we have statistics over them, and so on. Individual features. You can browse through here and search for them. We do have support now for uh, annotating feature groups, so attaching tags and metadata. It's not in this version. It's coming out in the next version. Uh, and then having free text search for any features across all uh, projects, in fact. Um, but in this case, we're just going to look at, at what's in the, in the current version, 1.2. And we can see that we have any trained data sets that were created will become available here. And again, we can have statistics for them. And what's useful about these statistics is that we can use those when we're training models, sorry, when we're, when we're monitoring models to make sure that the quality of the features coming in in our online model matches, uh, the, or the distribution of the feature values matches the distribution of the data we train them on. Because those descriptive statistics are available here um, with the training data sets. OK, so that's that's the, the, the kind of the basic overview of the feature uh, store itself. We then have notebooks in the platform that we can use. I'm going to go into this other project where I have some notebooks. And I'm going to show you an end-to-end -end pipeline that uses the feature store. I think it's already up here. So we have, And this is available on, on GitHub. You can follow this on GitHub. If you go to Hops examples on the Logical Crops repository, you'll see that there's a lot of notebooks in here. Um, this particular example is under the ML uh, directory, and it's in end-to-end -end pipeline. We have a lot of feature store notebooks in the feature store folder. <clears throat> this one is actually the scikit-learn one I'm going to do. So it's sklearn. So this is the notebook here. And there's also a Python program, because we need to do model serving with this, uh, and that's going to run in a Flask uh, Python server. So I'm just going to open this up and briefly talk through it, because we're running short on time. What we can see in this example is that it reads in a data set called the iris data set. It's flowers. We're trying to predict the type of, uh, the type of flower given the, the, the properties of the flower's uh, petals. And um, what we do here is we do some li a little bit of feature engineering and create a feature group. So now at this point, we've created two feature groups, the iris features and the iris, iris labels lookup. And this typically would be a job by itself. This notebook does all of it in one job. but 
what we can see if we go back to the feature store is that it created these two feature groups for us. So when we ran those um, cells, we got to here. At this point, um, a data scientist might come in and say, well, now I'm going to train a model with these um, features that are available. <clears throat> they can create training data if they want, or they can get a data frame directly from the feature store. In this case, with scikit-learn, we can take the data frame directly as a pandas data frame. And then what we can do is we can do some feature engineering. And in this case, we're just doing k-neighbors classification to train the model. It gets us 97% accuracy. We save the model as a pickled Python object, and then it becomes available in our platform. So that model, in fact, it will become available in here in the models that we've trained. And you can see I've trained a couple already. We have this iris classifier here. And if we look at it, we can see that the directory and the experiment that it was run in um, another example I have here is MNIST models that were trained. And again, we can go look at the actual models and the data. Um, so in the MNIST case, it's a TensorFlow one. So we have a, a protocol buffer object and the weights in the variables folder. And there's also a copy of the program in the Python environment that was used to train the model there. And if we go back and look at our notebook, we can see that we've, we've trained that model and we've saved it um, to the model repository. Now we were going to try and serve that model. So in the code, what we do here is we, we basically, um, you can see we have some code here. We're going to actually, it's actually it's a little bit more complex. It's going to, assuming there's many versions of a model, it'll get the best one based on our evaluation metric, which is the accuracy. So you can have, uh, and that's obviously a good thing to do. You, so in this case, we have two versions of MNIST. We'd like the one with the better accuracy. Uh, both of them are quite poor in accuracy, but you would take uh, version two over version one. And you can have any metadata you can attach to these models and, and to, to our feature groups. We, we have an API that allows you to attach JSON to it. Um, and um, then we have other APIs to look that up. So you can you can actually have many different, very rich metadata that, that you attach to models or feature groups. And, and, and with APIs, you can then retrieve that metadata. So once the model has been uh, chosen as the one to deploy, we, we call create or serve create our update on the, on the serving uh, component from our API. And um, then we start the model serving, in fact. So that this is really just gonna, it's gonna stop any existing models that are running and then start the model serving here. So I ran this earlier and we can see in model serving what happens. We have, in fact, two models being served. So I'll just stop the end this one. Um, but if we look at the ones that are being served, the Iris Flower one, <clears throat> what we can do is we can get the endpoint, the rest endpoint for this model and a client can then use with this endpoint, it can also um, go to the settings, generate an API key, and we'll call it um, uh, Iris. And that API key will be for inferencing inside a project. So a client application can take copy this API key that's created here, and with that REST endpoint, it can actually use the model now in production, which is great. Now, if you continue in the notebook, it shows us using the model from within this same notebook, and also, uh, not just using it, but also um, storing the request to Kafka. So the requests will be automatically stored to Kafka. And in this case, we're actually reading the and processing the request because we'd like to see how the predictions are going. So we can see this is example code to show you how to do that. And if we go back to the, to the model and we can see our model being served back here, model serving. Um, what we can see is we give logs for it and so on, but the, if we go to Kafka, we can see that there was a topic created. So this was the topic created. This is where our uh, prediction request will be stored and where we can monitor the model from. And then you can have uh, you know, a Spark streaming job, for example, with a dashboard uh, to monitor that model. Now, I'm conscious that we're running out of time, and I think I've covered the end-to-end -end, uh, training and uh, inference with a, an online model um, using the feature store. So I think uh, with that, I'm going to pause and we'll take some questions, if we have questions. Alia, Fabio did a really good job answering the questions. I think we just have maybe one or two questions that are unanswered. I'm going to read over to you. OK, let me find it here. Does the future store allow for dimensionality reduction processes? Well, dimensionality reduction is feature engineering. So it's a very well-known um, feature engineering technique. Um, you know, so if you're using, 
um, PCA or whatever, you know, principal component analysis, a way of doing dimensionality reduction. The feature store is really the place where you, you after you've done your, your principal component analysis and your, your input data, you, this is where you're going to store that output, those, those engineered features. And then your model can, um, can use that data. But if you're using PCA as your actual way of doing predictions, or uh, then it's, uh, that's kind of outside the scope of the feature store. Um, Get some extra questions now. Uh, next question, how free are platform administrators or users to update Python versions, packages, etc.? Okay, that's a great question. So that's, I think that's one of the number one issues that you have in, in data science platforms. So in our, our platform, I didn't cover this, but you can search for libraries and install libraries. So maybe I want to have an image library. And we support both pip and conda um, as ways of installing libraries. So if I search, for example, for an image library, I get a bunch of image libraries back from pip a lot. I can pick one to install. And <clears throat> what it will do is, it will basically, uh, if I have the base, we have a base environment to begin with, but it will clone that base environment and give me a, a specific Conda environment for this project. So each project can have its own set of libraries, its own versions. Um, you can even have your own private Conda channel if you're in an on-premise uh, air-gapped environment. Um, um, so, and you might have your own PyPy server as well. So for data scientists, they don't need to write Docker files. They can just search for libraries, install them, and make them available. And then if you have your own project, then you're free to, um, to pick whatever versions you want. Now, if you have production pipelines that need different versions of projects, well, then you put them in different projects, effectively. So if I have this, this production pipeline needs these libraries, and this other one needs these libraries, well, then we have two production uh, projects, each with different account environments. Uh, Follow-up question on that. Can we yeah. customize yeah. the PIP configuration and conduct files? Yeah, can we customize the PIP? You, what you can do is here, if we go to here, we can we can remove my Conda environment here, right? And I can, I can export the existing Conda environment and I can import, if I remove the entire Anaconda environment, what I can do is I, I can import a, uh, a new Anaconda environment. So it's not a requirements file in PIP uh, because honestly, we, we would prefer people to use Conda over PIP because they're more battle tested. We know from experience that users who, who just use PIP um, get a lot of problems with dependency conflicts. And, and, and if you're getting Conda libraries from the, the main upstream Conda, um, <clears throat> channel, then that works quite well. Kind of Forge works quite well as well. Um, but if you're if you want to go wild with PIP, you're you're allowed to do so. But uh, you know we kind of encourage it. We are actually deprecating in one three Python two, so it's just going to be Python three. So yeah, if you have a YAML file, you can uh, for your Conda environment, you can import it there. That's all the question time we have for questions today. But thank you everyone for participating. If we haven't answered your question, we will answer them by email uh, the next coming day, probably tomorrow. We hope you enjoy. Okay, thank you everyone.